Where is everybody? Is there something going on in 41? Yeah? Uh-oh. Yeah, it's either crash on 41 or the train. It's one of those two things. Causes people to be late. All right, um, I forgot to send this around on Monday. This is the roll sheet as of Monday morning, like the official, everybody who's enrolled. If your name's not on here, there's a problem, right? And it needs to be fixed right away. So uh, mark the, mark, <laughs> mark all last week, uh, <laughs> and then the, the two days uh, that we met this week, right? No fair signing up ahead of time, right? And you don't, it's not, you don't have to initial or anything, just to check, right? Just, just, Make sure that gets you. I'm trying to get it to go up and down the rows. Um, if you're passing it sideways, it might be skipping people. Um, I think is that the only thing I had to tell you today. I think that was the only thing I had to tell you today, um, as far as getting the course to go. In order to fit this in one day and not teach you things ahead of time that you're not going to forget and we're going to need later, uh, we're going to skip section 3.3. Okay? Um, I had an email from somebody saying something like, Mr. Balo, like, uh, in terms of like how the, the exam questions are going to be, like, uh, I think there was a section in chapter 2 that was about graphical methods of determining like velocity acceleration. So we, you know, you didn't talk about this in class. Am I responsible for this? Well, yeah, you're responsible for it, but really use the homework as the guide. Because that's what I do, okay? When I sit down to make an exam, I look at the homework, the questions I have assigned, and I'm looking for that medium difficulty, right, kind of problem. Um, and if I haven't, has to to do it on the homework, I really feel like it's not that fair. The, the, the one sort of caveat there is um, conceptual, con the ideas, right? There's no way for me to possibly cover uh, in all the homework all of the ideas, right? Um, and I try to give you examples of conceptual questions on the homework. Don't just blow through those. They're really easy to get right because you only have four choices or whatever, right? Really try to understand them because those will, those will trip people up. Um, so, so just the homework is really kind of the gold standard and like for example in chapter 3 you won't see any problems from section 3.3 and I'm telling you we're not going to do section 3.3 skip it for right now we're going to come back to it when we talk about multiplying vectors later right when we're in energy we have to multiply vectors and then later in torque when we have to multiply vectors so we'll get to it but for now use the homework as your gold standard for what you can expect to see on the exams. So, um, we need to talk, okay, uh, what's the vector? What the heck does that mean, right? Something with magnitude, and, uh, okay, yeah? Uh, it, it's a line at that point. Oh, okay, all right, so uh, that's a vector. In other words, it's an arrow, <laughs> basically, right? Okay, um, it's got magnitude and direction. So, a vector is a mathematical construct, right? That allows us to deal with things in the universe where it's really, really important that we know which way they are going. What do I mean by that? There's a lack of it. If I told you I was going 40 miles an hour, fine. That's my speed, right? But if I tell you I'm going 40 miles an hour north on Blackstone, well, that gives you a lot more information, right? Where I am, the direction I'm going, it's different than going 40 miles an hour south on Blackstone, right? Like it's velocity, it's really important to not just know how fast we're going, but what direction we're doing it in. Time doesn't really have a direction other than forwards. It doesn't move backwards as far as we can tell, right? So time would be something that we didn't have to worry about the direction of. What's something, what is it, what do we call something that has no direction? It's just a number, just a magnitude. Scalar. It's a scalar. So these are just fancy words in mathematics, right? A scalar is a number or, or something where you, we don't have any information about the direction. 
and then a vector is this thing that has both magnitude and direction. Visually, it is an arrow where the length of the arrow determines the magnitude, the number, how big it is. And then there is some sort of angle in the case of this vector, right? That angle could be measured from the positive x-axis, right? And so we establish some sort of direction. So um, let's, uh, this is not really a written down quiz. I want you to turn to each other, okay? And just go through this list and decide real quick whether these things are vectors or not. Go. All right. Is time a vector? No, I just said, right? It doesn't really have direction other than forwards and something that just has one direction. We don't care. Is mass a vector? No. No. It, mass is just mass, and we'll get to what that means later. Okay? Speed. Is speed a vector? No. no. Okay? It's just how fast you're going, right? Displacement. Is displacement a vector? No. Yes. <laughs> okay? What is the thing that's like displacement that's not a vector? Distance. Distance. So remember when we were doing this whole thing up here and I said, right, we, how far we traveled, right? If we go two to the right and then we go three to the left, what's the total distance traveled? It's five, isn't it? But what's my displacement? Negative one. And it's right there in that negative where we've got a direction, okay? So displacement is a vector. It has both a strength, a magnitude, and a direction associated with it. Is an elephant a vector? No. Uh, I kind of want to know if the elephant's running towards or away from me. But technically not a vector. Okay, force, is it a vector? Yes. yes. Not the force, that's different. Okay, but forces in general are vectors. They have magnitude and direction. Distance? No, velocity, yes. yes, right? So again, velocity and speed, you probably are used to thinking of those as the same thing. They're not. They're really close, right? Speed is the magnitude of a velocity, but what's the important thing we need to put on a velocity? A direction, okay? And then is an arrow a vector? Sure, why not? We already said, right? that um, the, uh, red, there we go, okay. We already said arrows are vectors. Now, so what are some properties of vectors? Um, vectors have names. Uh, if you've encountered them in math class, they usually have really boring names, like A, B, and C, and R, or something like that, right, okay. Um, this vector's name is um, Albert. What? What'd you say? Oh, okay. No, no, no. no this, this one, this, this vector's name is, is Albert. Okay. And um, I'm doing something funky there. I wrote the A, right, to indicate it's just some sort of generic symbol to be able to, you know, keep track of it or whatever, right? 
And then I drew across the top this arrow, okay? Now, you'll see this printed online and in books and in, in your book. Like, you'll see it kind of different ways, right? We're trying to indicate a vector instead of just a number. And um, in some places, you'll see bold letters indicating vectors. It's really ha hard to have bold like pencil, <laughs> right? Okay. Control B on the keyboard is really fast, but when you're actually writing it down mathematically, it can be really hard. So instead of having to like, you know, make this letter bold, what we do is we draw an arrow over the top, right? Technically, it's supposed to be an arrow, but in physics, we get really lazy. We don't like lifting our pen, so we'll we'll only draw half of the arrowhead. Okay. To indicate that that's a vector, this is just a number. Okay, that's, that's the difference between those two symbols, okay? We're trying to indicate that. Okay, so that's Albert. Um, and let's do, um, let's do this one. That's Beatrice. What can you tell me about Albert and Beatrice here? Yeah. They're parallel to each other. So we would say that Albert, do Albert and Beatrice have the same direction? Yeah, even though I didn't draw them on top of each other, right? They're kind of at the same angle. Another property of vectors is I can pick these vectors up and move them wherever I want, okay, in space, right? And as long as I, ma whoops, as long as I maintain, okay, the orientation, its direction, okay, and its magnitude, it's the same no matter what, okay? So... If I have a coordinate system anywhere, say, okay, like draw one here, draw one here, right? And then I go ahead and move Albert around wherever, okay? Wherever I put Albert, Albert stays the same. Albert doesn't necessarily have to be drawn right from the coordinate system axis, okay? So vectors stay the same regardless of where they're put in the, in the unit system because their magnitude and their direction stay the same. Okay, so if that's Albert, and this is Beatrice, right? Okay, what can you tell, oh, I made it almost, okay? What can you tell me about the magnitude of Beatrice? It's shorter, be nice, about how much? About half, right? Okay, I know, it's not this good, right? Okay, so, it, be it, so we could, we could, mathematically say that Beatrice is equal to half of Albert? Is that true? So a half is just a number, right? So if I have a half of Albert, I maintain the same direction, I'm not doing anything in the direction, and I'm only affecting the magnitude. So that would be a correct mathematical statement for what's going on there. But we need a third vector. Let's do, um, let's do this vector right here. Oops, that was a clumsy arrowhead. Okay, so that vector right there. Okay, and uh, see, we need, another, we need a name for this vector. Carl. Carl, okay. Carl, so that's a C, okay. Carl with a C, not Carl with a K. This is not Carl Jacobs of Mr. Beast fame. Okay, so Carl. Uh, Carl's come into the mix, okay? So what, what do you think might happen if we try to pull off this? try to add Albert and Beatrice together. We'd end up with a new vector? What would it look like? Call it W. Oh, okay. Right? We can give it a different name. But we want to add Albert and Beatrice together. And so would I just kind of put Albert and Beatrice kind of like head to tail? See, part of the problem here is how, how did you learn how to add things? 
went to school, right, in kindergarten, first grade, my teacher said, this is a one. All the kindergartners go, ah, right? And this is a one, a one, right? What's this, right? Two ones, yeah, yeah, two, right? Okay, right? And you kind of go through these motions, okay? She never really taught what it means to add things together, okay? And that subtraction is just addition of negative numbers. And you watch all the little brains fry when they try to think about that, right? And it's, it's so much fun, right, okay? I'm asking you to do that all over again in less than 50 minutes, <laughs> right, okay? With something that has not just a number associated with it, but also a direction. So when we add vectors together, the concept or idea in our head is we do one after the other. We do Albert, and then we tack Beatrice onto the end of Albert. And we come up with a new vector, okay, um, named Ralph, okay, uh, technically called the resultant, okay, that's what you end up with when you add things together, okay. So we end up with Ralph over here, Ralph, right, and um, we're done. But, okay, but what... <laughs> What is, oh my gosh, what is this? Oops, not, not Beatrice. Carl. Carl. What, what do we do? Like the picture in our brain, what do we do? Head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, right? That's the rule, right? Okay, so... Um, now that I've completely screwed everything up and I can't get, can I get this all by itself? No, it's gonna, yeah, that's what I thought, okay? We'll, we'll redo it, okay? So here's Albert, okay? And then we come along, okay? And we take Carl and we add them head to tail. Now, I know I'm cheating just a little, you're like, Mr. Bailey, you're cheating. You're using an iPad. I can't do this with the <laughs> Right, okay? Okay, so this is what you do, right? To copy this vector, you come over here with your pencil and you go, okay, it's about like this. <laughs> right, okay? Again, you're drawing them head to tail, right? And then where would the resultant be? Where did the resultant start? Where did, where did Ralph start? The resultant would be at the start of Albert and end at the head of yeah, okay, the resultant starts where you started and ends at the last vector, okay? So we would draw this resultant, this Ralph, different Ralph, would be right there, okay? But what if we, oh my gosh, what if, oh, getting, getting hairy now. What if we do A plus C plus Beatrice? Oh, so now... We've got to do another vector that looks like that a little bit, right? And then the resultant would look like that. Point I'm trying to make here is when you add vectors, the picture in your head, the concept behind all the math that we're about to do is this head to tail thing, okay? Head to tail, head to tail, head to tail. Let's do another example. Um, we're gonna go to In-N-Out Burger. Okay, on Ashland, right? Let's describe all the displacement vectors that we would have to do in order to get to the In-N-Out Burger on Ashland from here, okay? What's the first direction we have to go? Like from this building? We gotta go east to Blackstone, right? Okay, so we gotta get off campus, go east to Blackstone, okay? Now that we've gone east to Blackstone, what do we do on Blackstone? We go north. Okay, and then there's like a little tiny, we got to pull in, right? Okay, to the parking lot, right? Okay, so those would be all the displacements we would have to do. Maybe not exactly the roads, but all the displacements we'd have to do in order to get to the In-N-Out Burger. But if instead we built a drone to go pick up the burgers for us, does the drone have to fly this path? No. In order to figure out the path that the drone would have to fly, we find the resultant of all of those displacements. Vectors 
The reason we're dedicating a whole day to this mathematical concept of vectors has to do with the fact that we use these ideas constantly. Displacement, velocity, acceleration, all these things are vectors, and their directions matter, and they matter a lot. I can tell by looking at your faces that your brains are already shut off because I've been talking about math for more than five minutes. I mean, I can. And so this is the, chap this is the chapter that should have like the Surgeon General's warning on it. You know those warnings they put on the sides of like cigarette packs and stuff, like you smoke this, it'll kill you kind of thing. This one should have warning math content. You will be bored. So, I'm desperate, desperate to keep your brains engaged and all that kind of stuff, so I'm going to turn to comics. Have you ever had a day when a simple instruction in the morning would have made all the difference? I get where this guy's coming from. Right? It can, be, it can be really important. Order of operations, right? Very, very important, okay? All right, so let's, now that I've distracted your brain sufficiently, we can get back to some math, okay? <laughs> we need to be able to rigorously, mathematically manipulate vectors, be able to add them together, not just through some you know, poor drawing skills or any of that kind of stuff. And by the way, there's ways to do scale diagrams with vectors and things. But to really get into the analytical power that a vector has. And in order to do that, we got to define just a few things, okay? So let's see here. Let's make a vector. You can't see my ruler, can you? All right, fine. We're going to make a vector right there. Okay, and I made it a nice straight line, and we got to put an arrow head on. There we go. Okay, so there's a vector, right? Um, let's. No, nah, I'll just leave it general for now. This vector, Albert. Sure. Okay, um, is at an angle. We're going to call that angle theta as measured from the x-axis, okay? So how do I find out how much Albert points in the x direction? And how do I find Do you agree that Albert points in both the x and y directions? Yeah, what direction is it, is it right or left in the x? Point to the right, positive x, and then up or down in the vertical? Uh, up, right, okay. Do you have an answer? No? All right, so I, I want to find how much of Albert points in the x direction. Well, I just drew a vector there. And then I want to find how much of Albert points in the y direction. I could probably... Write that down as a sub x and a sub y. The a sub x and the a sub y, those are what we refer to as complements of vectors. Component of a vector always lines up along a coordinate system axis, right? There's going to be x components and y components. There could be r components. There could be theta components. Like, it depends on what coordinate system you're in. In physics 4A, we're primarily going to be using the Cartesian coordinate system. So we're looking for x and y components of vectors all the time. Okay? So notice, notice that the components add up to what? Yeah, they add up to the vector, right? So we're, we're obeying, we're already obeying the rules, right? Where if we take two vectors and we add them together head to tail, we get another vector. In this case, components always have, add up head to tail, okay? To be the vector that we started with. That's kind of nice, okay? But I told you that vectors can be moved anywhere, right? 
Let's see if I can pull this trick off. Can I? No, nope, see, it grabbed everything. I drew it too close. Oh, this is so fun watching an old man struggle with an iPad. Okay, we'll just do it over here. Can I pick up that AY? Move it over there. Are those two things the same vector? Absolutely, right? Okay. So don't get trapped into thinking I can only draw like the triangle, right? Matter of fact, oftentimes we will draw the vectors starting where the vector starts, right? Because I can pick them up, move them wherever. But we'll, we'll, we'll leave the triangle up there for now. Because these components are in the Cartesian coordinate system, what do we know about the directions of Albert's x and y component? Yeah, we already established that. They only deal in x and y. Yeah, so what's the angle between x and y? 90 degrees, right? Okay. So what kind of triangle did we just form? This is a right triangle. So if we know Albert's magnitude, and we know the angle that Albert points at, can we find the lengths? of the x and y components? Yeah, how do we do that? Trig. You trig, right? OK. All right, we need to have a talk. Um, to find Albert's y component, sine or cosine? Sine. Why? Because it's opposite over adjacent L over hypotenuse. Okay. Um, is it because y is always sine? Because that's what I always did in my high school trick class. Um, okay. We need to talk. Okay. So we need to talk about something called cognitive load. Um, if I have a triangle, right, and I have an angle, and it's a right triangle, and I want to find this side, I, and I know, I know the length of this side, but I want to find the, the, the horizontal side, right? Walk me through the steps that we would have to take to figure out the length of this side using trig. First step. Okay, so the definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent which some of us may have learned to use uh, Sokotoa. Yeah. I never knew Sokotoa existed until I started teaching. Like, it was a, it was a total revelation. I was, my students were like, Mr. Bill, just do Sokotoa. Like, what? What? What are you talking about? What's Sokotoa? Sign. Sign of the angle is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, okay, uh, cosine, cos, adjacent, whatever that means, over hypotenuse, and then tangent, stupid, is opposite over adjacent. Okay, right? So first step, we got to know what the definitions are, we've got to remember them. Okay, now, I'm looking for this side over here, right? The bottom horizontal side. Um, what, what side is that? Why is it adjacent? It's next to the angle, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, the angle always touches the hypot hypotenuse and the adjacent side. Did I get that right? Okay, so I've identified I want the adjacent, so that's step two. Step one, remember definition. Step two, identify adjacent side. Step three, now that I've identified I want the adjacent side and I know the hypotenuse, I'm going to use this, but what do I have to do to this to get what I want? Now I've got to do some algebra, right? Okay. <clears throat> so my adjacent side is equal to my hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. And now I can put in that x is going to be a times the cosine of whatever angle that is. That was like four or five steps. Cognitive load is a measure of 
like how many steps your brain has to take to do something. Um, it's a measure of brain processing necessary to step through a series of tasks and is an important psychological uh, thing to keep track of or think about um, in a variety of situations. For example, the Windows 11 user interface. It, it's been worse. You guys don't remember Windows 8. Oh, okay. But Windows, Windows 10 versus Windows 11. In Windows 10, uh, no, let's, let's just go. Windows 11, how do you put your computer to sleep? Where do you, what do you do first? Push the start button. I'm trying to finish. Why am I hitting start? They changed it to be the Windows button, but it's still the start menu, right? Okay. So now you're in the start menu. What did, now what do you have to push? The little power symbol. So now my brain not only doesn't have to read, it has to know symbology, which is okay. I use emoji. We can figure this out, right? So then I hit the power button, and there's like a drop-down list or a pop-up list or something that then says, well, do you want to like sleep, hibernate, blah, 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 blah. Okay. In Windows 10, you hit the start button, and then you hit sleep. Which of those two cases has more cognitive load? The one, the Windows 11 one. It's like buried. You have to do multiple clicks, multiple steps to get there. And like, this, is, this is a big deal. You're just being an old man and shouting about getting off your lawn and whatever. Your brain, even if it becomes muscle memory, right? If it becomes reflexive, still has to process that, oh, I want to sleep it. What do you do to sleep your phone? Oh, you're looking at me like, what? Right? I just put it in my pocket. Yes! That is the correct answer, <laughs> right? Okay? If you deliberately want to sleep your phone, what do you do? Push. <laughs> what action? <laughs> right? The cognitive load for that is so much smaller than what I have to do on a Windows 11 computer, right? Okay? So, why am I talking to you about this? I want to teach you a method that is going to relieve you of the cognitive burden, the cognitive load of having to go through this every single time. You can thank me later, okay? Because this is gonna change your life when it comes to trigonometry. This thing that I'm gonna show you pays dividends over and over and over and over again. It's amazing, it's like a magic trick, okay? So let me, let me try to describe what's going to happen here, okay? I call this my touching, not touching rule. As far as I know, I came up with this because I discovered it and I went to my teachers and asked about it. Notice it comes back to this angle, right? This angle seems to be at the center of everything, isn't it? Sine, cosine, adjacent, hypot all that kind of stuff, right? This angle will always be touching the hypotenuse. By the way, the touching, not touching rule, if you can't identify the longest side of a triangle, I can't help you. So you've got to be able to do that, right? The longest side of a triangle is the hypotenuse. Okay, right? So we've identified the hypotenuse. If you are looking for the side that touches, see how this angle is right here and it's touching? Then the answer is cosine. That's it. How much cognitive load is that? Say it again. I missed it. Yeah, okay. If the side you are looking, this is the side I'm looking for, is touching this angle, the answer is cosine. And when I say the answer is cosine, I mean you write the length of the hypotenuse cosine theta. If the side you are looking for does not touch the angle. See the side over here, but this angle's over here. Angle's drawn, so it's not touching at all, right? Okay. Then it's sine. And you're like, duh, Mr. Balo. We just established that using the long method. Okay. But let me show you where this really starts to pay dividends. Okay. What if instead the angle, uh, we'll do blue, was up here? 
Oh. If you're over here, what do you have to do? You kind of have to reestablish which side. Da, 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 da. But in my method, if I want to find, if I want to find this bottom section, is it touching alpha? No. What is it? Sine. A sine alpha. Now, is AY, that side, the vertical side, touching the angle alpha? You betcha. So AY is going to be a cosine theta. And now, all of a sudden, some of you are nervous. Because, Mr. Bale, I thought X was always cosine. And Y is always sine. No, 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 what if we had a situation where we had a vector like this and we had an angle theta right there? Okay, find the x and y components for me. Okay, this is Beatrice maybe, right? There's Beatrice's x component up there. There's Beatrice's y component right there. To find Bx, sine or cosine? Sine, how'd you do that so fast? It's not touching the angle. Sure, it's opposite, okay? But it's just simply not, Bx does not come into contact with theta. So Bx is going to be B sine theta. And what's By going to be? Cosine. And we're done. And we move on with our lives. And we have way less cognitive load. You have more cognitive load for video games. Yes. What's that? Oh, I got too excited. <laughs> Luckily, there are things called electrons that can be erased. There we go. Thank you. This will seriously help you. Okay? When we're in the deep of vectors, trying to figure out forces and directions, when we're in <laughs> tilted coordinate systems, <laughs> <laughs> okay, right? And we're over here, and this is the X, uh, uh, sure, and this is the Y, okay? And we are like, okay, we got a vector that's pointing over here, and we have this angle theta right here, right? Well, how do I find the X component? Well, the X component lies along the X axis, right? And this one, the Y component lies along the Y axis. To find the X component of that vector, sine or cosine? Cosine, how do you know? It's touching the angle, right? This would be whatever this vector is, cosine theta. This and over, over here, this one right there, is it touching the angle at all? No. So what is it going to be? Sine. But Mr. Bayo, there's no triangle there. Well, yes, there is. I just can move the vectors wherever I want, right? Okay. It's still. Uh, the components are still at 90 degrees to each other. It's still a right triangle, even if I didn't draw the triangle, but it's still going to be sine of that angle. We want, there's plenty of cognitive load in physics. <laughs> we want to eliminate as much mathematical cognitive load as we possibly can. Okay, so those are, the, uh, I, um, you guys are really kind of, I could just see it in your eyes, right? All of this math, we're not doing physics, we're not, right, okay? Your brains are shutting off. You do realize that um, there was a, there were psychologists, uh, brain neuroscientists out of um, Sweden, I think it was, and uh, they put people into functional MRI machines. These are uh, specialized MRI machines that in real time can show the brain function, like what it's doing, okay? And they made them do math problems and watched how their brain lit up and did things, right? And then they pricked their finger with a, with a needle, right, to draw blood. At least that's what they told them, right, where you just need a blood sample, right? What they were looking at is what their brain did when they experienced pain. And the picture for pain and the picture for math were the same. I'm not joking. This is, this is actual published information, okay? Scientifically validated, peer-reviewed data. Math causes pain. 
At least in the brain, it causes the same pain response. So um, to alleviate your pain, I'm willing to do pretty much anything, right? To entertain you, keep you engaged, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Including lowering my dignity, right? This is my vector hat. It comes out when vectors are happening. So if you walk into class and I'm wearing my vector hat, you know. You know. It's got a button on it that says, I'm a scientist, let's experiment. Uh, another button I got from students says, welcome to Endor. Visit the lush forest moon. I like my buttons. Okay. It's got a, it heats, my head heats up and it starts to spin. All right, let's, um, let's do a quiz. Let's do a quiz to see where you are at with understanding how vectors work. Do I have? Yeah, I do have the quiz numbers. Oh, good for me. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, on the PDF, they'll be included this picture. It's just in case my drawing wasn't working for some reason. Tough as we go here. Uh, I've got a vector. Did I write down? I didn't write down my vector. Okay, that's fine. Let's invent a vector. Um, somebody give me a number between one and 10. I heard four, the loudest, okay? So we're gonna do a vector, um, A, Albert, okay. Uh, four, we'll leave the units out for now. Could be a displacement, could be meters per second, could be anything, okay. Four units long, and give me an angle between zero and 90. 31, I heard. So four at 31 degrees. All right, I need uh, another number between one and 10. Nine. And another angle. I think I heard 26 first. What'd you say? 60. We'll do, okay, we'll do 60. All right. So those are our two vectors, okay? We have magnitude, we have direction. We want to be able to add them together. Okay? I showed you adding had us put sort of head to tail visually. Mathematically, adding vectors means that we put them together component by component. So to add two vectors together, we've got to find their x components and add their x components together. And then to find their y component of the resultant, we add the y components of the vectors together. So on and so forth. So first step when manipulating any vector, adding and subtracting, we need to find the components of these vectors. So how do I find the components of these vectors? What I like to do is I like to draw a little coordinate system and I draw my, it's not to scale, right? But I just try to, that's probably too small. I just try to draw my vector pointing off at approximately the angle it's at, right? And, and maybe approximately the length. It, it's not that important other than just to set visually what we're doing, okay? So the 31 degree angle is here. So how are we going to find AX? It's going to be the magnitude of A, 4, and then sine or cosine. Why? Touching. Cosine 31 degrees. And then to find A, Y, it's going to be 4 sine 31 degrees. I confess that once I found one, whether it's sine or cosine, I know the other one is the other one. I tend not to think about it. Okay, so we need these numbers, and cleverly, I have not left enough room to do any of this. So let's move that over there. Let's move that over there. Okay. Uh, well, 31 degrees is what we were given, right? So better have degrees mode on your calculator. If radians is the unit we're working in, then radians mode in your calculator. Yeah, no. It's, uh, we'll talk about that uh, later. Okay, for right now, degrees. So, did anybody get four cosine 31? Three 
3.4? Anybody else get 3.4? Okay, good. I love it. 3.4. And 4 sine 31? 2.1? Do I have agreement? 1? Good. Okay. And let's do, uh, let's do B. So B is X component, B is Y component. Uh, B, what does B look like? B kind of points up like that, doesn't it? Okay. The angle's over here, 60 degrees. And again, I'm looking for these. I didn't draw a Y's component, but it would be along there. Okay. So um, sine or cosine for the X component? Oh, cosine. Okay. So... 9 cosine 60 degrees, and this one's going to be 9 60 degrees. All right, so we'll get those. Does anybody have 9 cosine 60? Four point five. 4.5? Anybody else get 4.5? Yeah? And then 9 sine 60? 7.8. Going once, going twice, people are nodding at me. I love it. It's like the best error correction algorithm in the universe. All right. Now that I've got those two, I'm to add them together, okay? We're literally going to add, add them together, right? All the X components are going to add together. All the Y components are going to add together. So what is uh, 3.4 plus 4.5? 7.9, right? 7.9. 2.1, 7.8 is 9.9. .9. Is that right? I'm on a roll today. So what is 7.9? The X component of what? Of the resultant, right? It's what we get. If we added together the two components, so that should be the X component of the resultant. And then this one also is the Y component of the resultant. So in adding vectors together, we add component by component, and that gives us the components of our resultant. So our resultant is pointing positive X, positive Y. How do I know it's positive X and positive Y? They're both positive, right? How do I now find the magnitude and direction of the resultant? We know that this vector goes over 7.9. I needed a different color. Come on, different color. It goes over 7.9 and it goes up 9.9. .9. So it's sticking up somewhere over here. I don't know. Okay. How do I find the length of that thing? It's a right triangle. How do you find the length of the hypotenuse? Pythagorean theorem, right? So to find the magnitude of R, notice no vector symbol over the top. I take the square root of the x squared plus the y squared. squared. Somebody please find that for me. And then... How do I find the angle that this vector is pointing at if all I know are the two sides of the triangle? Inverse tangent. Tangent. I'm sorry. I don't have a clever way to help you through tangent. Tangent's just dumb and you've got to deal with it. Okay? So if you're going to memorize anything when it comes to trig, you just have to memorize that tangent is equal to the opposite over the adjacent side. Okay. And so the opposite side in this case is the, the one not touching 9.9 .9, and the adjacent side is 7.9. But now I need theta, right? So I need to do the inverse tangent, whatever that means, of that ratio right there. 9.9 .9 divided by 7.9. .9. Okay. Did anybody get the square root? 12.666. Uh, sure. 12.7. Okay. And so that's its magnitude. And then, does anybody have the inverse tangent of 9.9 .9 divided by 7.9? 7 what? 51. 51 point? Okay. 
we'll go with it. 51.4, I'm not actually. So, so the resultant is a vector that is 12.7 at 51.4 degrees. What would happen if we subtracted? If instead of doing a plus b, we did a minus b, what would happen? a minus b, we would take the, for the x component, we take the 3.4 and add a negative 4.5, because that's what subtraction is, right? It's adding the opposite, okay? And with the y component, we would subtract those, 2.1 minus 7.8, right? And then we would continue on, right? So vector subtraction is just you multiply negative signs through the components and you're done, right? And you keep adding, adding the components together, and away you go. I have um, one more thing to show you. A couple more things to show you. So um, this picture is trying, trying. It does a fairly good job, okay? It's, it's kind of busy. But here's my vector A, right? And it has components X and Y. And then the vector B with its components. They've just picked them up and moved them into different places in the coordinate system, okay? But do you see how the x components add together to become the component for the resultant that's sitting right here? And then the same thing happens with the y components, right? They all add together and become the y component for this thing right here, right? So this resultant's y, x and y components are literally made up of the x components of the vectors that went into them. And then if I were subtracting this, right, if it was a minus b, then this would be minus b, right? This would be minus b, and my vector would be pointing, not that way, it would be pointing over there, right? So that's what's going on conceptually in <laughs> the math, right, of getting these vectors together. Yeah, those dinosaurs are smoking, and the caption says the real reason the dinosaurs became extinct. I, I, I can believe it. Right? Far Side was a great, just excellent comic. All right, so I want to talk about a special vector. How many of you have heard of a univector before? In case the half, the rest of you don't worry about it. You are, won't have any baggage when it comes to this, which is fantastic. All right. The word unit in mathematics has a special meaning. What does it mean? One. Okay? It means one. So what's the magnitude of any unit vector? It's always one. Just always is. Okay? They have special directions, these unit vectors in physics. Okay? Now... To indicate that the vector is special, okay, the symbol that we use is not an arrow. A unit vector is special because it always has magnitude one, and a unit vector always wears a hat. That's an I, and that's a hat. That symbol over the top, okay? If I had a vector R, it would wear a hat. That's the caret symbol. Was that shift uh, six or seven on the keyboard? Right, okay. It's that little pointy up arrow thing, right? It's called the caret. It has nothing to do with the vegetable, I think. Okay. But there are three very special unit vectors in the Cartesian coordinate system. They're I hat, J hat, and K hat for reasons that I have no idea. I, I was told one year, because physics, in physics, uh, we've often done this. 
X hat, Y hat, and Z hat. When you look at that, do you know what direction X, Y, Z hat are pointing? Yeah, X, Y, and Z, right? Okay. And you know they're unit vectors because they have hats on, right? Okay. I was told one year, Matt was walking down the hall and I was teaching this stuff, and she came in and she's like, You can't do that. Okay, why? Those are special derivative symbols. I never found out what that special derivative is. I really don't care. It had probably has something to do with nothing, um, knowing mathematics. So um, we just stick with it. Gets, most books now use the I, J, K system. So, so we, I guess we ran out of letters or something, right? But I means X, J means Y, K means Z. And the very, they're special reserved symbols, I hat, J hat, and K hat, for those directions. Why am I telling you this? The unit vector, because it has magnitude one, can actually be attached to things to indicate their components, okay? What was our component before uh, over here? Uh, we had 3.4 and 2.1 for vector A, okay? So I could write vector A, I already forgot the numbers. 3.4? 3.4 i hat plus 2.1 j hat. Notice, trying to communicate that Albert is made up of two components. One that points along the x and one that points along the y. And when I add those two components together, what do I get? I get Albert, right? That Mathematically, I've just encapsulated that whole idea of components being at right angles to each other, right? And adding together to get the resulting, or in this case, the Albert vector, right? It's all encapsulated in that symbology right there. By the way, the I hat is often, I mean, you can, you can get all fancy with, the, it's like a curly script I kind of thing, like that, right? But often, we will write it as just sort of a, like that would be I, but we leave the dot off and we just put the hat on, okay? So that's this, like when you're writing in script or kind of going fast, this is typically, like when it's printed, it tends to look like this, right? But when it's written down, like, and J, sort of the same thing, right? A J typically is supposed to look like that with a dot and you put the hat over it, but, but oops, no dot, right? You just, you just do J hat, okay? And then, well, K is this, right? Put a hat over it. But we tend to leave the dots off. So there's A, okay? Here's B. Uh, what were the numbers for B? 4.5 and 7.3? 8. Thank you. Okay? So I can write down B like that. And now, now, when I go to add A and B together, I can mathematically, literally do it. 2.1 J uh, plus, and then 4.5 I plus 7.8 J. What do you do with numbers when they have the same symbols attached to them? You combine them together, right? And factor out the common symbol. So this would be 3.4 plus 4.5 with an I hat outside of it, plus 2.1 plus 7.8 with a J outside of it, right? And what's 3.4 plus 4.5? 7.9, I hat. And what's 2.1 plus 7 point? That would be 9.9, .9 J hat. And what did we just get? Same thing we got before, right? In a more sort of compact notation than that, <laughs> right, okay? And if I want to go and find the length of the, right? It's 7.9 squared plus 9.9 .9 squared. I'm going fast, my handwriting's getting really bad, right? I find that and then the, 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 the angle would be the, end, right? All that's the same. So, uh, 9.9 .9 over 7.9, right? And away we go, we get the same answers, okay? And, and, and what happens if we do A minus B? Well, that's 3.4I plus 2.1J minus, parentheses, 4.5I 
plus 7.8j. What do I do with the minus sign? I distribute it through minus 4.5i minus 7.8j. And now what do I do? Combine terms, minus 4.5i. And I really don't care what the numbers are. Plus 2.1 minus 7.8 in its little jacket. Right? And then I would do the numbers in my, and I'd be done, right? The power of a unit vector in terms of working through the math is to keep track of our x and y components in a more consistent way, right? And so I expect you to be able to deal with a vector whether I give it to you as a length and, a, and, a, and an angle, right? A magnitude and a direction, or give you a vector that's got i and j components in it, be able to just read off what those components are translate back and forth between them, right? But the unit vector notation is super duper powerful when it comes to dealing with keeping track <laughs> of vectors. Um, and, and we will use them, we'll use them quite a lot. Uh, as an extra bonus feature, um, does anybody want to take a stab at what r hat means? Yeah, our hat. What direction does R point? What is R? It's like a radius, isn't it? Like in polar coordinates or spherical coordinates or something like that, right? Okay. So what direction does R hat point? It's not the resultant this time. Yeah. Think of a circle. Think of the radius of a circle, right? Okay. And we have the radius of a circle, right? Okay. And then in polar coordinates, we'd also have an angle theta. What direction does theta hat point? <laughs> it points in the theta direction. Which the, what's the theta direction? Around. Right? Positive theta going this way, negative theta going this way. Right? Has unit, what's the length of theta hat? One. It's, it's a unit vector, right? It has length one, and it points in the direction of theta. R hat has length what? One. one. What direction does R hat point? Out. What point, what direction is negative R hat? In. What way does gravity point? In. So are we going to see negative r hats when we start talking about gravity in chapter 13? <laughs> yes. I will see you tomorrow for lab numero tres. So read the lab before you come in. Be familiar with what you're being asked to do because we're going to talk about computers a lot. <laughs>